Hi, Roy here. Welcome back to my channel, Roy Reads Anything. Anything including Victorian literature. So this being Garb August, I thought it'd be interesting to delve into the, the world of Victorian trash. Is there even such a thing? You know, you sort of think of maybe the 19th century as being the, that's where the respectable classics come from. Well, yes, that is true, but um, let's see. So in order to do a little bit of research, I had a bit of a search on British newspaper archive using the search term trashy books and found some interesting things. One thing that kept coming up was not from the literary pages but from the the court reports so you get um, news cuttings like this trashy books and train wrecking at Swindon Police Court on Thursday John Goodship aged 15 years of Stratton St Margaret pleaded guilty to placing stones on the Great Western Railway with intention to wreck a train the boy read trashy books all day and placed heavy stones in front of the West of England Express at 10pm and he got sentenced for four years that's pretty serious pretty serious doings so reads trashy books all day goes out to wreck a train nobody was hurt but uh, trashy literature and its fruits at the Guildhall London on Monday Edward Engledew aged 16 and Harry Tucker aged 15 both employed by Mr J A Russell pawnbroker 37 were charged with stealing 10 pounds in money and watches chains and studs and a large quantity of goods quantity of trashy books were found in the possession of the prisoners, including the footpad, the smuggler and the prison breaker. The boys told the policeman who arrested them that it was the reading of those books that had led them into this trouble, demanded for further inquiries. The effect of trashy literature. Boy named Kelly sends a letter to his employer saying your doom is sealed you will die this week <laughs> learn they came from reading trashy books sensational literature back at the guild hall again uh, oh this is the, this is that case again but with a bit more so the edward engledew harry tucker case quantity of trashy books were found in possession of the prisoners including consisting of consisting of The Headless Pirate, Sweeney Todd, The Barber of Fleet Street, Lightning Dick, The Young Detective, Margaret Catchpole, or The Female Horse Stealer, Footpad, Smuggler, Prison Breaker and Murderess, Old Mother Brownrig, and The White Squaw, The Boys of England edition. Interesting, giving you that bibliographical detail. It's the Boys of England edition. So just unpacking that a bit. So Boys of England was obviously a regular periodical that would have that kind of sensational stuff in it. Some of these other publications were freestanding. You know, it was called, cool. if you had your, had your penny, you would be buying your episodes of, uh, say, uh, Lightning Dick, Young Detective. So that has amused Jenny so much. Um, so, of course, what, what we're talking here, folks, is the famous Penny Dreadfuls or Penny Bloods. So sensational literature that came out aimed at working class boys, um, was viewed with suspicion. I mean, this, this thing of it being an excuse for crime um, was in itself, it was satirised in Punch. Um, with the idea that, well, if, if it's books that cause crime, then the logical, re the logical solution is to close all the bookstalls. Um, but, you know, there was a moral panic about it. <laughs> By the way, if you want to, if you're at all interested in this sort of stuff, I really recommend Boys Will Be Boys by E.S. Turner. This book came out in the 40s. Um, history, the story of Sweeney Todd, Deadwood Dick, Sexton Blake, Billy Bunter, Dick Barton, et al., uh, and it starts with 
a brilliant picture of um, Frank Reed's story. Frank Reed Jr. with his new steam horse among the cowboys or the League of the Plains and a picture of a steam powered horse. If that, that gets you excited, then E.S. Turner. So, um, yeah. They were a thing. Can you get them now? They're very difficult to track down because they were really ephemeral publications. Nobody was binding them in leather covers and proudly keeping them in their libraries. Uh, well, few people were. Um, in recent times, a couple of books that are out at the moment. Penny Bloods, Gothic Tales of Dangerous Women, edited by Nicole C. Dittmer. This is out from the British Library, one of their beautiful publications with a foiled cover. And you get a brilliant collection of stories called things like The Skeleton Count or The Vampire Mistress, The Wild Witch of the Heath or The Demon of the Glen, The Female Bluebeard or The Adventurer, The String of Pearls or The Sailor's Gift. Wagner the Werewolf, The Dark Woman or Days of the Prince Regent, and The Wronged Wife or The Heart of Fate. So this looks awesome. Nicole Dittmer makes an interesting point in the introduction about how a problem there is with the Penny Dreadfuls, is if they were successful, then there would be almost too much of them because the publishers would keep producing them, keep getting the writers to add in subplots, backstories of characters, etc, etc. Um, whereas if they were unsuccessful, they'd just disappear. So um, what, what, what's happened in here is she's edited down some, um, these, these, some of the stories to focus on the, on the interesting aspects and particularly this, uh, the idea of the dangerous woman. So I'm looking forward to reading that. Also, there's an outfit called Gannet Games who've brought back a few Penny Dreadful series in pretty decent productions. So you get some uh, a, a glossary, illustrations, typesetting looks good. And um, yeah, so you get an entire series there, The Shadowless Rider or <laughs> The League of the Cross of Blood. So looking forward to those, um, in terms of books about them, I've mentioned E.S. Turner, I've invested in this massive uh, Robert Kirkpatrick's From the Penny Dreadful to the Hapney Dreadful, a bibliographic history of the boys' periodical in Britain. Uh, so lots of, lots of cool info here. If I was ever going to write something about these, this would be my first port of call. And um, much stranger is Arthur Edward Waite's The Quest for Bloods. So people interested in the occult may have heard of A.E. Waite because he wrote a lot beginning of the 20th century about occult and mystical matters. Also, the Rider Waite tarot deck. Oh, He's the Waite. Yeah. He's the Waite of that. So it turns out that A.E. Waite was a collector and even writer of Penny Dreadfuls. He was absolutely fascinated by them, owned lots of them, and he didn't write a coherent book, but his writings about them have been collected into this study of the, of the Victorian Penny Dreadful, which, I mean, he himself used them in a kind of almost mystical way, you know, so the the, the, the tropes of the Penny Dreadfuls, the, the sort of um, misty moors and so on, are, to him, they're like arcane symbols. So it's, a, it's an interesting read on that level. And also, he has a sort of taxonomy of them. So he divides them up into the Highwayman stories. Yes, the quest anatomised. So he, he, he calls it the byways, so this is like sub-literature. So he's sort of um, got a nice way of thinking about it as this kind of almost an alternate world of literature that nobody respects but has all kinds of cool stuff in it. Uh, so yeah, Legends of the Road. And there were tons of those, you know, I mean, that's something that seems to have dropped off. You don't get so many highwayman stories these days. Um, 
City Purlews and Pageants is a fancy title for things like uh, The Merry Wives of London, The Wild Boys of London. That was uh, suppressed by the police. So one issue people had with the Penny Dreadfuls is not just that they were sensational and full of violence and gore, but also that they would exalt the criminals, uh, including including youngsters like in this Wild Boys of London. Um, and you got school stories and um, occult stuff like Varney the Vampire. So uh, yes, the world of Penny Dreadfuls is one one thing Victorians gave us. But returning to my searches of trashy books as a phrase, it wasn't all about that. So here's another quote from Sporting Life in 1860. Um, a lecturer advised his hearers not to waste their time on the thousand trashy books that come out, whether three volume novels or the inundations of green and yellow shilling books to be found on every railway station, but to give their attention to such works as could be read as, with as much pleasure the second time as the first. So we got trashy books that are three volume novels. So that's, you know, rather than spending one penny for an ephemeral piece of pulp, three decker novels. How can that be trashy? You know, it sounds like the luxury end of the market. Um, and the answer is the circulating library. So that was another way that fiction was commercialised. So that you would pay to hire, to you know, rent a book to read it. So if it's divided into three, you've got to pay three times just to get the to get the end of one story. Um, so that's sort of how that worked. Um, and then yes, there were sort of primitive paperbacks, these kind of yellow backs that you get in station bookstalls as well. All sorts of stuff there. Another cut, another press cutting headed trashy books. I suppose young ladies are your principal customers in the matter of trashy books, was asked of a city bookseller. Not a bit of it. The mummers are as fond of light reading as their romantic daughters. I guess if you'd come in here some day and see the books they buy, you'd believe me. It would astonish you if I should tell you the names of some of our regular customers. The idea that cheap literature is read mostly by shop girls, apprentice boys and the poorer classes He's all wrong. There are women of culture and refinement who buy these books. Women who have abundant wealth and nothing to do but to recline upon their richly upholstered sofas and read. <laughs> no, they are not shop girls and chambermaids, but fashionable women who ride up in their carriage and take away loads of common trashy novels with them. As if you're recognising yourself in this, these descriptions. A young lady comes here regularly every week and buys lots of a lot of these books. She is an American and oh, appears to man. be thoroughly educated and refined, yet she reads an almost endless amount of this trash. We have about 200 regular lady customers. You couldn't get one of them to read a book written by George Eliot. <laughs> um, yes, so, and it was also seen as being a potential cause of like um, mental illness. I've seen a young lady with her table loaded with volumes of fictitious trash pouring day after day, night after night over highly wrought scenes and skillfully portrayed pictures of romance until her cheeks grew pale, her eyes became wild and restless and her mind wandered and was lost. The light of intelligence passed behind a cloud and her soul was forever benighted. My own story exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she was insane, incurably insane from reading novels. She's too fond of books. From a book called, well, indeed, from Pastor's it Jottings. Has turned her brain. So, uh, so watch out. So, an another thing, I suppose, the Victorian era, as well as the triple decker novels, it, it went the other way towards the end of the century with the rise of the magazines magazines publishing serialized stories so novels broken up into chunks um, which of course meant it affected the way they were written because they had to be 
had to have enough cliffhangeriness to keep people reading and they had to be divided into regular size bits um, and short stories as well uh, short stories really came into their own which is important some of the genres we're interested in you know like um, supernatural stories detective stories the, the short story really was a sort of um, the, the ground from which a lot of those sprang um, so putting all of that together it meant in this period you had the rise of the commercial writer so authors who would write for money on demand to what editors wanted um, which I suppose is um, if not a you know, I mean, I suppose many writers, probably the most literary writer ever, might not actually be writing if nobody was going to reward them in some way for producing their work. Um, but you had writers who were like fiction factories. L.T. Mead, for instance, was a woman who uh, was incredibly productive across a range of genres. Um, there's a great collection of her supernatural stuff out called Eyes of Terror uh, from... Swan River Press in Dublin. Um, so this is this is like a lovely book, um, use, really useful introduction about the the, the stuff she wrote. Um, so a lot of stuff she wrote was like girl stories for girls, but she also wrote some highly respected ghost stories. Uh, she had an occult detective called John Bell, uh, but she. You know, she wasn't sitting in a garret writing what the muse brought to her. She would have, she had two typists taking dictation. She says every morning she'd, she'd dictate a few thousand words, go off to work, come back, check the galleys that evening and correct them. And then the whole thing would proceed again. Mary Elizabeth Braddon, another super productive bestseller of the past also the celebrity author people were fascinated by her as a person um, slightly transgressive person perhaps in her private life as they were by her her literary output and these are the kind of authors people would want the latest Braddon they wouldn't think mm, let's see is this going to be you know what what's the blurb like am i going to read this is it a, what kind of what kind of story is it um she'd be like yeah i love me braddons um so good good way to get into her would be the face in the glass gothic tales of mary elizabeth braddon in the tales of the weird series um and i'm reading one of her romance books for garb august called the doctor's wife um, I'm also reading a book by Edward Bul Bulwer-Lytton. So Bulwer-Lytton, again, you know, used to be household name famous. Apparently he, he wrote some Penny Dreadfuls in his, in his, in his salad days. Um, but goes down in history for having started one of his books with that phrase, it was a dark and stormy night. He's the guy... Who actually wrote that? It. Yeah, which might have overshadowed his brilliance. So I'm going to read the last days of Pompeii. But again, another thing I've picked up is his collected weird and supernatural fiction, or supernatural and weird fiction even. Um, so this 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 includes um, a novel called Zanoni, and 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 some shorts and some poems. So uh, so that looks good as well. So all these writers are still out there. Another thing I was going to say was the Victorian era, it's like the birthplace of the genres. So the genres we love and from which we would get our, our trashy reads as well as some of our good reads, um, a lot of those can trace their origins into those times. Um, although the original work isn't necessarily what we would call a trashy read. So if we take Frankenstein, for instance, no one well no one but it would be unlikely that it would be criti criticized as being uh, not a literary classic you know it's, it's, it's got all, all sorts of importance as um, as a novel of, of, of ideas and, and so on um, but if I look at my Frankenstein collection I've got you know there's a novelization of a, a film that was the sequel to an adaptation of, of Frankenstein. There's a novel 
that's a novelised sequel to that film. Um, there's a book called Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but it is not written by Mary Shelley. It is, in fact, a novelisation of a film based on the novel. Um, got copies of the novel with pictures from the films. Got things like the Frankenstein wheel, which have all sorts of fanciful ideas about how the Frankenstein monster can be, can be resurrected. Um, a novelisation of The Bride of Frankenstein that was published at the time and was, was in bookshops as a media tie-in for the movie. So it's had this strange life and a lot of these books are pure entertainment. So the ideas from Frankenstein have fed into um, all sorts of all sorts of stuff. Um, and I suppose, you know, I, I would say the Sherlock Holmes detective stories aren't in themselves trashy, but these if you want to find trashy detective stories, you don't have to look very far. Um, but it isn't necessarily the case that there's some kind of originating classic that then gets turned into trashier stuff. So Dracula, for instance, I could have done the same thing with Dracula stories as I did with Frankenstein. This Dracula does all sorts of things, you know, he's, he's in all sorts of, um, all sorts of pulpy productions. Uh, but Bram Stoker didn't invent that out of whole cloth. In fact, Varney the Vampire, the famous and huge, going back to Nicole Dittmer's point about how successful Penny Dreadfuls would be all extended and extended. So Varney the Vampire precedes Dracula. It can't be known whether Bram Stoker had read it, although it's thought it's a bit unlikely that he wouldn't have at least known about it just because it, it, was, a, it was a famous thing. Um, likewise, there are all sorts of detective stories. And you're also thinking about those kind of fusion genres, occult detectives, gothic romances. Again, they sort of come out of the same period, um, often by just somebody really successfully puts elements together that are already floating around. You know, so Sherlock Holmes is a great synthesis of some lots of detective ideas and then the Holmes canon gets copied and copied and copied. Um, so there's that. Adaptation was happening as well. I haven't really found novelizations in the same sense as we have them now. It seemed to work the other way with um, author's work being adapted. Um, even while it's even while it's appearing onto the stage, for instance, so you'd get um, stage plays of uh, Dickens novels um, appearing on stage before the novel was even finished in its serialised form. Um, Frankenstein. There are loads of adaptations of that on the stage. Some of them sound mad. Uh, Mary Shelley even saw one. Thought it was quite good. So you know, there are also weird text adaptations or copies of famous works so Dickens would be Dickens was so popular that people would bring out like the same story just with a few words tweaked and character names changed so you could read about Oliver Twiss, Nicholas Nickleberry, Martin Guzzlewit and so on again <laughs> simultaneously with the real ones and um, yeah well exactly <laughs> um you know and you, you can't get enough of mr pickwick well how about pickwick in america <laughs> oh, why not so why? not a coherent thesis there just to show you there's trash back in victorian times in all sorts of exciting ways um, and some of it I'm reading for Garb August. Um, give me a shout if you want any um, any tips or pointers. That's all I came to say. Back soon with something else. What is Garb August? It's a reading event devised by Criminoly, and it's all about reading trashy books and enjoying them. So. Trashy, not as in bad, but as in as in awesome, as in entertaining literature that's undemanding, written you know, to attract us in with some sensational content and stuff like that. So 
The idea is you just read a trashy book, that's all you gotta do. But if you want, there are prompts you can follow. There's theme weeks, there's a bingo card, there are decades, so the idea is to find trashy books from different decades, or Instagram prompts if that's your bag. Uh, also, whole universe of co-hosts of which I'm one, and you can watch trashy movies as well, or instead. Plus, there's a read-along book, which is Valley of the Dolls, Valley of the Dolls, all the details down below. Yeah, I wrote 21 books last year, and 20 the year before, it's a world record twice, and I'm now on my 10th uh, book since Christmas. 